Um, I'm going to talk about my experience that Christine mentioned a little earlier. Um, and what I want to do is just frame sort of why we reached out to the private sector. So I've been working in malaria advocacy for the last eight years. Um, despite the hundreds of millions of dollars that have been mobilized by a number of donors around the world, there's still uh, a gap, a pretty important gap, to be able to scale up our effective interventions and reach elimination before our interventions no longer become effective. Um, some estimates put that at $2 billion a year. So the donors kind of said, well, you know, this is, you know, this is huge. It's unlikely that we're going to be able to mobilize this kind of cash from the existing donors. We need to mobilize um, domestic resources. And those domestic resources are country national budgets and private sector. So my work has been primarily in Africa, and so we looked really specifically at the African private sector, which is for the most part an untapped resource uh, for health. So, so, you know, this is kind of gives you a sense of why, you know, we set out to do the work that we did. And so what I'd like to do is to share with you kind of how we went about uh, recruiting uh, the, the African private sector and some techniques that we've been able to um, use and sort of standardize. Uh, our program exists in seven countries uh, that are all malaria, well, six that are malaria endemic and one which is in pre-elimination, which is South Africa. Um, so just, I'll, I'll share with you kind of a process and then some of the impact and some sort of um, uh, recommendations about how to, how, to, how to be successful. And this really is geared for you who are NGO or working with civil society uh, and with um, host country governments. Um, so basically what we did, and this echoes quite a bit what uh, Adi was saying, we started with a vision. Um, that vision was to be able to get uh, malaria endemic countries towards the endpoint of near zero deaths related to malaria. And that vision was, we articulated it clearly, talked about leveraging assets, etc. But basically the idea was that those companies that we were going to approach needed to embrace the same vision. And we realized that those companies that did not embrace that vision probably would not go that far with us. And so we did a little bit of, again, what Ati was talking about. We did kind of a triage. We did research. We did our homework to understand what our companies are already invested in. What are they already interested in? What is their core business? How can we, how can working on malaria control actually further their core business? And so we, we, we ended up kind of limiting the number of groups that we approached but we're really selective and smart about uh, the companies that we approach. Um, the next sort of pillar is data. Uh, you absolutely have to have your numbers crunched and distilled so that you can be speaking very uh, precisely about what your issue is. So for us, for instance, we knew the number of deaths uh, related to malaria in any given year, and we uh, boiled that down to a specific number that was linked to deaths per minute. And then we, because we were also tied into a football platform, and I'll get to that, we tied it to the number of deaths per football game to be able to give whoever we were talking to a very specific, concise notion of the gravity of malaria in Africa. Um, so, so we also um, looked at other numbers. Um, you know, how, how were children affected? How were pregnant women affected? Um, how were um, companies and national economies affected? And we used those numbers as well when we spoke to our um, private partner, um, potential partners, I should say, at that time. Um, and then once we were able to sort of define an area where the, the partner would be interested, it was interesting because we did not go with a request for money. And I think this is something that set our, our partnership uh, apart. Um, we never went in saying, well, you know, if you could give us $100,000, we'll be able to do X, Y, and Z. No, we basically said, if you adhere to this vision, let's sit down and think together about how we can achieve it and how, you know, we can each leverage our assets. That's the other thing that's sort of a, um, uh, you know, a, a little, you know, secret to, you know, being able to be successful is you go into that discussion knowing that you too have, have assets as an NGO. So many times people say, oh, those NGOs, you know, they're, they're always asking for stuff. Well, you know, you have assets. You have, um, you know, either experience, and Adid mentioned this as well, you've got 
um, you know, knowledge of the community, knowledge of new markets, understanding relationships with government that are also very interesting to a private sector partner. And you ask the private sector partner to leverage their assets as well. They may have a terrific, so for instance, we're in communication, they may have terrific media presence. And so that media presence could be leveraged for a health issue, for example. Um, and, and, and what was really exciting was we ended up getting a lot further towards our goal by not fixing dollar amounts on a request um, and having people leverage their own assets in the way that they felt comfortable. And, and, and something that I would add to um, uh, Adib's remarks was that it takes time. These relationships are nurtured over time. Um, you know, the first time that you sit down and you talk about leveraging assets towards a common goal, the, you know, the contribution may be quite small, but over time it grows with success and with interest and with enthusiasm. And, and you know, today we can count that uh, we have approximately 115 African private sector companies that we've worked with, and some have just gone in directions that we could have never anticipated, and their engagement is so robust that we don't even need to be there anymore. And that's really exciting.